This is Peter Mulder from Brutus and you're listening to the new scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the new scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And we've got another great one this week. We have Jeff Jenkins of Code 7. Code 7 have just put out an excellent new LP, their first in 19 years. It's called Go Let It In. It's out on Equal Vision Records. And I would dare to say this is their strongest release yet. I really enjoy the record, and I really enjoyed this conversation with Jeff. We cover everything, the new record, recording the new record, reteaming with Equal Vision Records, Code 7's history, their breakthrough LP, The Rescue, and things take a turn I really did not expect at one point. It's a really, really interesting conversation, and that's coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Follow us on Twitch at The New Scene. Reviews. We need Apple Podcast reviews. I'm still trying to get us over 200, but a few new ones have come in. We're at 162. So if you haven't rated us on Apple Podcasts yet, open up your podcast app on your iPhone. Search the new scene, scroll down, hit that five-star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it at the end of the show. And you can always email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Hot Water Music, the 30th anniversary tour. That kicks off in 2024. And guess who's opening? Quicksand. That's right quicksand and hot water music it doesn't get any better than that check their pages for a full list of dates the iodine mystery box is here pick one up today for some randomly selected vinyl from the iodine vault you get two lps for 25 dollars four lps and a seven inch for 50 dollars or three seven inches plus a limited flexi for 18 dollars rebuilder will be performing on cruise askew That's the Jay and Silent Bob Cruise, which takes place February 23rd through 26th. Check out Rebuilder's page for more info. And Jerome's Dream have East Coast tour dates in February. Check their page for a full list of dates. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor, Bridge Nine Records. War on Women will be headlining We Out Here Festival, and that is a festival that celebrates feminine voices in underground rock. The festival takes place February 23rd in St. Pete, Florida. Check the Bridge Nine page for more information. Incendiary Device have announced select tour dates, and those run through May. Check their page or the Bridge Nine page for a full list of dates. Sign up for Bridge Nine's email list. You'll get information about new releases exclusive in-store shows and events, and promotions that go out to their email subscribers regularly. And don't forget, through the month of December, you get 20% off in the Bridge9 store with code NEWSCENEPOD at checkout. Did you hear what I just said? 20% off. If you're buying something for yourself in the Bridge9 store or buying somebody a Christmas gift, Make sure you use that code. Stop by the Bridge Nine Record Store at 282 Rantoul Street in Beverly, Massachusetts. Check the Bridge Nine Instagram page for the holiday hours listing. For more information, head to bridge the number nine.com or to the Bridge Nine Instagram at Bridge Nine. That's Bridge N I N E. Okay, so listen, check back in with me. In segment three, there's a lot to cover. We've got new reviews. There's some insane show announcements that happened. We've got Dillinger Escape Plan, 
performing with Dead Guy and the Callous Dow Boys. What? What? And Dimitri is back on vocals for Dillinger. We'll talk about that. There was another insane tour, Koyo, Anxious, and One Step Closer that got announced. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening, and we will cover all of it. But right now, we are going to speak to Jeff Jenkins of Code 7. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Jeff Jenkins. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hi, Keith. Thanks for having me on. Yes, Jeff. I'm excited to have you here. You know, you have a rich history with Code 7, who have just put out their first new record in almost 20 years. Yeah. It's called Go Let It In. And you know what? We're going to talk about all of that and probably more. But first, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? Uh, well, I just uh, said goodnight to the drummer who was here helping with some technical issues uh, as far as our live show goes. But other than that, um, getting ready for a show on Friday. It'll be our first show in a while. So, yeah, super excited. Doing great, though. That's amazing. How long has it been since Code 7 has played a gig? Uh, we played a gig last year uh, in 2022. So, yes, we're looking at almost two years. That's got to be exciting, right? Yeah, I think it was like uh, 2022. It was a benefit show for our friend who had passed away, and it was a great gig that we couldn't turn down. So we jumped at the opportunity. Um, and then, uh, you know, we got really busy writing music. So that took up the most part of that year and a half to two years that we were writing. And, uh, now we're ready to present it to the world. Amazing. Amazing. First new album in what? 19 years, 2004 was the last one. Dancing Echoes, Dead Sounds. That's right. Um, uh, that one was, uh, done by a fellow named, uh, Michael Birnbaum. And that was our first uh, album with Equal Vision Records. Yes. And you're back on Equal Vision now. Indeed we are. It was a chance that we just jumped at. Uh, they're so kind to us. We feel like we've been treated so great and they have supported us so much. So why not go back with people that you're already comfortable with? It feels sort of like family. Exactly. It's a great label. Legendary. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I think Dancing Echoes was the 100th release from Equal Vision, which was really, uh, that was kind of an honor to have us be number 100, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. When did the band make the decision that we were going to write new music? Um, we, you know, we never, when we, we broke up, we didn't... Uh, continue to hang out with each other constantly and three of us uh three of the band members are brothers uh, i'm not one of the brothers and uh, eric's not one of the brothers but the other guys matt james and john um they've always made music together and it was a matter of us just uh somewhere in that time period when we stopped playing just not having a dialogue together musically um we still had a lot to say musically with other artists like a few artists around town but we never uh, finished the conversation musically that I feel like we should have continued to have. And it, uh, it was that decision was made to get together and write music when we played, uh, after furnace fest, we were like, Hey, you know, wouldn't it be great to just get together and make music like we used to. And, um, you know, because the whole time, that whole 20 years, 19 years or whatever, we're still getting together to watch football games. We're still going with each other to cookouts and, you know, celebrating family. You know, I've worked for John and James uh, uh, and I've worked for Matt at their businesses. So it's just like, you know, we're always around with the, I've worked for all three. I've actually worked for Eric at his businesses too. So it's like, we have been around each other constantly. Why not continue to have something to say musically? And I think I had a lot of stuff. I know for a fact that I had a lot of stuff in my head that I wanted to say, so we all got on board with it after Furnace Fest. We were like, yeah, why not? Let's spend a little time together and, you know, finish these these unfinished things that we had from way back in the day, even if everything that we, because everything that we wrote was completely new, but it had been unsaid, you know, uh, over that period of time. So when we came out with this music, it was exactly what I knew it would sound like, which was each of our voices represented on the 
on the recording. So you played Furnace Fest. When was that? Last year? Uh, the year before last. Ah, uh, year before yeah. last. Yeah. Okay. So how soon after Furnace Fest do you get together and start playing? Um, <laughs> it depends on who you ask. Um, <laughs> we had uh, we had the entire recording process was kind of like a, a one-on-one. Uh, Matt and myself would get together. James and I would get together. John and Matt would get together. James and Eric would get together. And Eric and I would get together. And... You know, Eric and I had actually worked on music in the interim together, but we just never released anything. And, you know, uh, so when I heard uh, the other ideas that the other little factions of the band were doing, I was just like, this is amazing. You know, this is this is what I hoped it would sound like. And, you know, these are just the demos. So, you know, Eric and I had jammed together and a lot of his... Um, like I said, I, the only way I can describe it is like a lot of the things that Eric had to say on the album had that sound that I've always appreciated from him. You know, like uh, it's just a distinction that a musician has, even if they don't have a physical voice, they have a way of performing their instrument. And it was just kind of magical because each band member got to shine a lot uh, in this process. And me having been, a, you know, the guy who just handled vocals prior to that was so excited to have this flourish like it did because like uh, it's it's not too difficult to imagine that even Matt's drum style it has a voice that is Matt and it can be heard through the thread of the things that we had recorded and released previous to that it's just the way that Matt plays his drums you know the way that James kind of handles ethereal parts of our music and will be very synth oriented when he composes something the way that John is really all about like the brute force of the bass guitar and you know like the he- you know the heavier aspects and the heavier elements on this album were definitely uh John our bass player definitely had those pinned immediately and when i heard this stuff i was just like this is brilliant and then, you know, we fussed and fought and it was World War Three every other night. I quit the band like every other night. <laughs> did you really? No, 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 no. We all did. We all quit the band every other night. So it was we took turns <laughs> quitting the band. And uh, to say the least, it's uh, it's just it's not a thing. <laughs> Quit, quitting quitting the band is not a thing. It's not an option. What do you guys squabble about uh, during the writing process? Uh, <laughs> it. It varies, I guess. Uh, Matt really wants me to uh, to shine in a way that's unique to me. And as a drummer, telling a singer, you know, you have you have to get on top of these parts. This this might this part right here might have been a little late, or you might have sung that without the proper amount of attention to this, you know, this specific accent or whatever. So you know, all of us would go back and forth between that. And I was so obsessed with, you know, kind of like nuzzling in on James's, uh, a synthesizer elements, uh, that he had created. And, you know, maybe you should bring the, maybe you should roll that back or something. I would say something like, you know, like, uh, so it was definitely about what's good for the good of the song for each of us. And, you know, Eric, Eric, he doesn't fight at all. He's the, he's the tiebreaker. You know what I mean? Like, uh, if two if two of us are on one side and two of us are on another side, Eric's usually there to say, uh, you know, listen, you guys just, you know, you're overthinking it. You know, simple things like that. But um, we all kind of support each other, even though, uh, even though we may say some of the most ridiculously mean and cruel things to each other, <laughs> uh, we're still family. Yeah, yeah, and it can be tense. During the creative process, during the writing process, I know myself, like whenever anyone tells me to do anything, my my automatic response is to just be like, no, no. And then I, I have to drop that and think about if it if it actually improves the song and serves the song. Yeah. If you look at it from a perspective of, uh, I, have, I have a very like, uh, I visualize things in pictures a lot more than I think anybody else in the band. But mm-hmm. if you look at it in the perspective of we've all got to get together on this one thing, you know, I realized that my instrument, the the vocals are really, if you look at it, 
they're kind of the most needless thing. Like, what do you need to ha- have actual music? Even though at the dawn of mankind, singing was like the first instrument, you know, beating on, you know, beating on things with sticks or whatever, that was probably the second instrument. You know, when mankind started celebrating life and, you know, mourning things and, and having, you know, certain times of the year where we would all get together and celebrate, what else is important? You know, not some singer singing about something ridiculous. You kind of just need to feel the guttural instinct of the music. Uh, and that's, that should lead you in the path of what's good for the good of the song. In other words, uh, jazz musicians have an awfully cool thing about it when they don't have uh, like any kind of verbal cues on stage. They'll just look at each other and they'll just lock eyes for a split second. And then the song takes you to a completely different improvised place, you know? Hmm. And that's, to me, that's a very, very, uh, if, what's the word I'm looking for? That's a perennial human emotion. You know, that's something that has been with mankind since the dawn of mankind is like humanizing uh, or a human being synchronizing in song. You know, it's just, you know, you got to kind of look at it like that. So at the end of the day, we all had to suffer on bits that got chopped. We all had to suffer on critiques that were made by other members but none of us regrets any of those changes now because it just turned out the way that we wanted. So when did you guys all get into a room together for the first time uh, and start playing this stuff? Uh, maybe about a week ago. <laughs> no, uh, no, <laughs> um, no, seriously, that was probably, uh, January, February, December, January, February, because the ideas were coming so fast that we got together in November and set ourselves maybe like a time frame or something like that. And then it was just kind of a constant effort to round out a certain number of songs like, okay, this part sounds like it might go good with this part. So if you go back and look through our text thread that we had, not only will you see all the ar- uh, arguments that we had, but you'll also see all the iterations of the songs that never occurred. And I, you know, like I, I appreciate what did occur so much more than any of that. You know, there was never a part that I uh, had to have that I was completely married to that didn't make it to the album. You know what I mean? Like, uh, that's, that was a good thing about this whole process, but yeah, us actually playing together, uh, was different technologically this time. So, we got together and practiced at James in James's basement, and then we got together in Matt's studio, and now we reside in my basement, which is really cool. It, it just came to the point of where, uh, okay, we got to start getting together every week, and it's tough for everybody. Everybody has families, and we all have jobs that are uh, so much more <laughs> important than the band, so we are able to get together. And do it more stably now that it's in my basement. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Because we, when we started getting together in, um, in James's basement, uh, it was that was where we did all the preparation for those shows that we played, like the Furnace Fest show and then that Benefit show. And then I think we did the First in Flight show. And those were all practices that we had in James's basement. But what was different this time is that we went to Matt's studio. Uh, he has a music studio at his house. And he's got, you know, like he's Matt's really the the glue of this entire project because he's got like a really good ability to produce things. And um, Matt single handedly produced all of our recordings that ended up being uh, mixed uh, by Jeremy Griffith. So it was pretty cool. So that's what we hear on the album, what you recorded and what was mixed by Jeremy. Yes. That See, I was going to ask about that because the production is so good. Uh, we recorded some of the vocals with Jeremy, and Jeremy's Jeremy's voice can be heard on the album, and I was so excited about that because I think up to this point, I had not been able to collaborate with someone who was so comfortable with vocalists because Jeremy was a vocalist, it is a vocalist himself. And what was great is that not only did he help with, uh, you know, so, some of the... Uh, the more unique ideas on the album. He also said, that's your keeper. That felt a little cheesy. I really knew that Jeremy was the guy for recording vocals with when on like the second or third day, he started meowing our lyrics. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Singing a song, but saying meow. It was so wonderful. I was like, man, he's the guy for me. He's already, you know, 
already a mate, you know, on the level. <laughs> it's a good sign when you see the engineer doing something like that. Like I recorded recently and then afterwards he was like humming the riff back. And I was like, okay, that means it doesn't suck. I'm I'm happy with that. You know, there if you are Keith, if that's your issue, then you should really consider just, you know, uh let it all out when you're in the studio. Use that time to your advantage. And and like somebody's going to re- really enjoy what it is that you do, no matter what. Even if like, I don't think that I've ever worked with a producer who wasn't a halfway decent person. You know what I mean? And yeah. I know they exist in the industry, but if they're not creating a vibe for you to come in and do what it is that you do, it's better suit. You're better suited to try to find somebody else who can help you curate that vibe so that you can convey your song. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, like you, I'm fortunate that everyone I've recorded with the vibes have been good. I haven't been in a situation where it's like very mechanical and cold yet. So happy about that. Yeah. I hear that happens in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so was it like, was it trippy all being together and writing, you know, first album in almost 20 years? I mean, do lost memories come flooding back? Do you remember stuff from old times? How was it for you? I don't remember anything, Keith. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I, It wasn't that I don't remember it. It's just that I have, you know, very vague memories of places and times because we were gone. It's, you know, during some years we were gone for like six to eight months out of the year just traveling constantly and playing. I mean, our schedules were pretty, uh, pretty stable there for a few years. We were just, you know, touring and trying to get, make a name for ourselves in the early aughts. It was all we did. And yeah. then, and then, you know, like when it came time to write dancing echoes, dance, dead sounds, we all lived in a house together or we all lived in a house together previously, but this was a different situation. It was more like we, um, we wanted to, you know, push even further on, uh, sort of like the more ambient aspects of the album, mm-hmm. and we didn't know how to communicate uh, as efficiently as we did this time around, which was great. I think before there was a lot more of the bickering, but it was done rather than in a text thread. It was done face to face in in the studio. <laughs> um, yeah. But we had an amazing time writing that, and we had an amazing time writing this too. I mean. I was very, very lucky to end up in a band with my best friends, you know? Absolutely. Go Let It In is the new record. How about this, Jeff? I think maybe best Code 7 record yet. We are tighter than ever. There's excellent riffage. The ambient ethereal aspects are spot on. The vocals are strong. I love it. What do you think of that? That's so kind of you. Thank you so much. Um, it was really an honor to have someone say that, that it's, it's really cool. You know, like, um, I, I appreciate where it stands and everything else that we've done, but you haven't heard the best one yet. We haven't recorded the best code seven album yet. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I read a quote from you. You said the goal was to make the best record yet. With this new record, you said something to that effect, right? At some point, probably maybe? sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you've done that? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely do. Um, there, there is just a cache of ideas that continue to flood out of each member every time that we get together to rehearse. You know, like, and we're just rehearsing the music that we've written. So it's like, wow, we're continuing to build. I think this is what it feels like to be in a stable band. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Because, like, uh, I, uh, I, I can give give you a good example. Uh, for our upcoming show, uh, there's a song on Dancing Echoes Dead Sounds called Alt Wave. And uh, I didn't really, no one was really feeling when we played Alt Wave live uh, here in my basement, you know, to to start rehearsing. Um, so I just said, why don't I just, why don't we just do a stripped down version? I mean, we know it like the back of our hand. And so we just did like a completely stripped down arpeggiated keyboard ambient swells matt does some electronic dump, uh electronic drum stuff and we just changed it into the it's like this you're hearing and experiencing the same song but it's now got new blood and i think it's important because songs are not concrete they're they're living things you know i like that i like that i i get very stuck on it's recorded we must play it exactly 
like this, and I, I would like to be a little more free with that. Uh, first time I ever saw Smashing Pumpkins, I mm-hmm. was so disappointed because I was like, it doesn't sound anything like the album. But the older I've got, I'm like, yeah, I'd like to go back and hear that same Smashing Pumpkins concert again now that I'm so familiar with the material that they were playing then, you know, because I could probably appreciate that live show so much more as an adult rather than when I was younger thinking, as, you know, I was a teenager when I saw them. So I was like, um, just thinking, wow, it doesn't sound anything at all like their CD. Well, if, if the older me could go back and say something to the younger me there, I would be like, if you wanted to hear that, why didn't you just stay at home and put on your headphones and put on the, you know, put on your, put it on your stereo you know, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's cool to portray your music live in a completely authentic to the recording kind of way, but um, there should be elbow room. The song is not a, you know, it, it's it's not a stoic thing. It, it, it might be kind of boring if it were, in my opinion. Yeah, and think about it. You're getting a completely unique experience if you're there and something new is happening. Yeah, I mean, and you should be able to pull it off live. Yes, you should be able to pull off your album live, but if something happens and you feel like going outside of those boundaries, you should also not force it into the, you know, into the concrete thing that is your recorded song, you know? Like, uh, let it have new life, you know? I, I, I know it sounds cheesy, but I like it when you know, very well-established bands, you know, play really long concerts and somewhere in their concert, they play like a medley of things. And I think that's kind of like, yeah, you know, I I came to see your concert and I wanted to hear those other things, but I got an abbreviated version with it and I don't hate it, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. So when and how did you join Code 7? The original singer left... And uh, when did you enter into the discussion? How did that happen? Give us some of the story. Uh, I was working at a record store at the time, and a coworker had uh, some mutual friends. Uh, the band that I was in, I was playing guitar, and I'm so thankful that Ben um, had a very kind soul who was able to reach out to me and say, hey, we think you're a better singer in this other band than you are a guitar player. And I was like, I'm cool with that. <laughs> you know, like I've, I don't, I don't claim to play guitar. I was just doing it because it was the thing to do, you know? Yeah. And, um, who, by the way, I'm still friends with that person. I think it's so great that all these years later they were like, yeah, you would have probably ended up just playing guitar in our band the entire, you know, instead of ever exploring code seven. Cause it was the first time they, you know, they were friends with my coworker and my coworker ones comes in one day and is like, yeah, they're looking for somebody who can scream. And I was like, okay, I can try to scream into a microphone. And I met these guys and we all had the identical music interests, like they're to a T. It was just like, wow. And to find out they were- What were some of them uh, at the time? uh, Fear Factory, uh, Slayer, I think. Um, There were, you know, there were so many other, Megadeth, there are so many other metal bands and like they were really into Steve Vai and Devin Townsend and all these other things that were just like, you know- a, a new a new scene of rock sepultura you know like uh when it, uh carcass death i could go down the list testament anthrax the things that i grew up on the things that i thought uh i thought metal should be you know but the at, at the same time there was this really weird movement in music that was moving toward more toward the um what would become the new metal scene and so you know, our first recording it had l- there's lots of new metal uh, influence on that. But after shortly after I joined, a fellow named Dave Owen joined, and Dave brought with him this total punk attitude and aesthetic to the songwriting. So we leaned into that with the second album that we did, uh, which was called um, Sense of Coalition, and it really it kind of like helped that we were um able to make all these connections because of Dave. Dave would help us um book shows and stuff like that. And and then on the third album, which was uh called Division of Labor, that one was recorded by uh Kurt Ballou in Boston. And that was just like a I mean it was a, a magical time for heavy music. You know what I mean? Because all these bands were exploding like Converge and Cave In and you know things things were happening with music that took it 
into an indie rock realm, which we really appreciated. And yeah, I'm sorry. You asked how I joined the band. I'm just giving you the rundown here. I'm sorry. No, but this is, this is great background because yeah, like, uh, going back through the discography, I was like, oh, I didn't quite realize that Code 7 was that new metal back in the day. On a sense of coalition, there was like there was like some straight new metal songs with very hip hop vocals, which I'm into. But you know, it was just interesting to see the uh, the progression from a sense of coalition to division of labor, and uh, that's around when I came into the scene. There was like a melodic hardcore metal thing happening that I really was into, and I'm still into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, some of our big influences then were obviously. You know, when we first got together, I think one band that we all agreed was like, you know, we, you put this band on a pedestal was Faith No More. And um, they had always kind of combined those elements. And, um, you know, when we were when we were branching out a little later on, um, those kind of like Deftones and Tool and, you know, bands that kind of bring uh, a mystique to uh, heavy riffs, you know, mm -hmm. I just decided, Hey, I kind of like this more. In my opinion, it's not that I didn't want to see people hardcore dancing to breakdowns because I love seeing that, you know, but our music just kind of like we were, we were discovering other things. We were, we were all really big into a band called Jawbox. I know you're familiar with Jawbox, but um, that's, that had more influence on, uh, the Division of Labor album than, say, something like uh, Earth Crisis or Strife or any of that, you know, anything like that. It had, you know, I think that album was also, we were really, really uh, into the idea that you can add a little prog in there and it'll, you know, it'll come across well if you, you know, if you, you, if you, if we, if we hadn't stuck with that element, I know that the rescue would not have emerged um, but you know, in between the, uh, division of labor album and the rescue is when Dave parted ways with us. And during the rescue, we were all living together for the first time as well. Um, pretty much all five of us living together in a house, which was cool. Uh, and there, there, you know, just, there came about this, this time period, all the other bands that were also trying to do it. And we were just so excited to kind of have, uh, sister bands such as dredge and you know this day forward and bands that we just love touring with you know there were so so many great fun times that we were making music that was kind of unlike anything else that had happened before i mean i guess each individual music scene can say that about itself but it was really cool to be traveling and to be the odd man out at a hardcore show to be the only guys there that kind of like used more delay pedal than, you know, the other bands. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's how you first got on my radar, because I used to tour with This Day Forward and sell merch for them sometimes. And I remember The Rescue being out, and I remember everybody being really excited about that album. And I'm going to get there. But, so Dave leaves. What what Was he just not feeling the band anymore? What happened with him? Um, I think there was, you know, we'd all started, uh, I think Dave was going to school and there were all other kind of, you know, lots of things that were happening like internally with the band that just, I think we all agreed it was the decision, the time had come to part ways. And, you know, thankfully Dave is still, like I said, there's never been bad blood you know what i mean like dave has always been my family dave is always one of my brothers and he's always a member of code seven so that's good um yeah yeah it it, it it just happened um and then we right after it happened we bought a bunch of new gear and i think that was kind of like uh the birth of around that time was probably the birth of the rescue because we started writing like making demos around that time uh so that was going to be my question like how did the shift in sound come about? So you're the singer now. We have these influences. We have the new gear. So we just started doing the new thing, I guess. Um, we we lived together, and I would stay up all night writing patches on James's GR33. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, and James and I would collaborate. Uh, uh, James and I collaborated on a lot of the album, The Rescue. 
Um, but like, uh, there were piano sounds in there that he was able to get through the GR 33. Um, it's like a guitar synthesizer unit that was, uh, it was really popular at the time. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I love guitar synthesizers. Some of the greats have used guitars and synthesizers together to magnificent effect. Um, but I think that during that time period, I was very focused on, uh, reading the fucking manual <laughs> for, for for those things, you know, those devices that made, I don't know, they just made me feel like, wow, technology is coming a long way and synthesizers and guitars can be work, can work together, you know, hand in hand. And I know that Matt was also, uh, into those ideas of like, you know, the stereo field isn't just what we've been told. It's, ex it's a very expansive field that human beings can hear. So, you know, it's important to, to fill up that audio space. And so that's the reason why we wanted to work with somebody who'd been, you know, pretty much on the cutting edge of experimental, uh, rock and roll at the time, who was Alex Newport. I mean, he recorded, um, at the drive-in and Mars Volta mm. and it was just like, it was so cool because he also spoke those languages and he also read those fucking manuals. <laughs> I hope you. I hope you don't mind that I'm swearing on the air here. Oh no, it's it, that is uh, totally allowed. We are we are allowed to curse here. It is. I have marked the podcast explicit. The people have been warned. You you, you told me if I had any questions at the beginning. You, you, like, do you have any questions? I should have asked. Can I swear? I really want to swear. <laughs> people do ask that a lot, and I'm like, yes, let it fly. Yeah. The 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 G. What was it? The GR33. Yeah, it was. Uh, MIDI effects unit. Um, is that is that how you get that cool effect on the lead in uh, the rescue, the song? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that's good. To, I'm making a mental note for later. I like that. I'm sure they have some pedal that can do it now, but yeah, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Um. It it created a what was what it was was uh you run a line out from the GR33 that's just like a um like a, a line through and he would mix his signal with the piano sounds that were created by the, that were triggered by MIDI. So basically he hits one fret and he gets the, you know, the guitar part will ring out, but yeah, you're right. Axe effects and Helix and all those companies, they can all do that so easily now. But at the time, yeah. at the time he had to have a special pickup on his guitar and it was cool because, you know, we, we really went down the rabbit hole with those things. Yeah, because you didn't in two thousand two. You still didn't see many big pedal boards like you do now, and now you see less big pedal boards and just that Helix board that everybody has. Yeah, yeah. Oh um, man, you know it's funny that you should bring up that kind of technology because um, a, a, a little personal note about myself here is in that twenty year period that Code Seven wasn't doing anything. I picked up the uh, the skill of circuit bending and i was just like building my own pedals building my own synthesizers and what's cool about that is you hear all of that stuff on the new album so um it's really cool like we used a couple of my circuit bent gadgets for um you know just for ambient noise but what would happen is that we would sample my voice into a sampling uh keyboard or something like that and then i would um just kind of manipulate my voice on the fly and jeremy was able to pick out certain parts he's like we got to use that for this the end of this song got to use that for the and they're just like the little interludes the little things that change in between songs at the beginning of songs and at the end of songs and i was so happy that i got to actually use some of the gear um that i had uh modified and but yeah like uh technology has come a long way but at, at the end of the day i'm really all a you know all I think about all day long is breaking technology. How can, how can I make technology work for me by, you know, getting inside and seeing how it works and rearranging the wires, you know? I like that. I like that. Yeah, that's an area I want to get into as well. Uh, if there's ever time, one day, one day, I would like to bend some circuits. Why not? A good thing to start with is a keyboard from the thrift store. You know, just mm. pick up a kid's keyboard uh at your thrift store in the little toy section take it home if it takes batteries it can be circuit bent you know just um all you have to do is you know clean it up put some fresh batteries in it expose the circuit and because it's only about three to nine volts it's not going to shock you keith 
You know what I mean? <laughs> and then just explore with, um, you know, I started, you know, with just alligator clips and little jeweler screwdrivers and just exploring the circuits to find out, you know, how to reduce the clock speed or, you know, add like a, a you know, a photo sensor so that you can have like an optical theremin on something. And it's really fun to, you know, just like, it's, it's a good relaxing hobby. And, um, I'm sure my wife doesn't agree. My basement that we have to practice in is just wall to wall Casio synthesizers, te- <laughs> Texas instruments, speaking spells, so many Furbies, so many Furbies in my basement that have circuit band. <laughs> That's really interesting. I <laughs> I love that. I, I just love the idea of that and incorporating it into the band and everything. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, um, it was definitely something that um, I thought, you know, like, there's something magical to it. Because, you know, like, these electronics are all going to end up in, an, in, in a landfill, you know what I mean? And they still mm-hmm. they still have so much life left to them, you know? And it's so funny, because like, uh, we live in a disposable culture now that doesn't really like, you know, if you can't fix something nowadays, it's just pretty much easier to throw it out and buy a new one. And, you know, that kind of makes me sad. So I have a lot of love for these musical instruments that are unloved, hanging out at the thrift store, hanging out in the music shop. So I bring them home and lobotomize them. (laughs) So it's 2002 the rescue is out. How is it for the band at that time? How was the reception to this record? Oh, that was that was kind of weird because we didn't know um, we didn't really know what we were doing as far as like will we ever write another heavy album again? You know, um, are we going to listen to what people are saying that say that they like our heavier stuff better? I mean, all the things that you would hear if you decided to, you know, throw a curveball at people after you had already sort of established a sound. And to me, I didn't really, I I witnessed it from from this side of that. So had I been a fan at the time, I would have probably been upset. I'd have probably just wanted to hear the older stuff. But I think eventually everybody got it. And, um, you know, maybe it was about a year or two after we started touring with the, you know, the the album the rescue that other bands like us started popping up and we were able to grab onto those bands and ride their coattails you know <laughs> what kind of bands were you touring with at that time uh like i said dredge um you know we ori- uh, uh, originally i guess i would probably have to say uh the most unique experience that we had is um a band called love lost but not forgotten from st louis we just they flew i think they all drove out to north carolina and after meeting them and them spending the night at our house one night, we, we, you know, meeting five other people, all of us, like 11 of us jumped in a, like a 15 passenger van with a trailer and went out on tour together. <laughs> and oh wow, well. yeah. And that was a lot of fun, you know? Um, but there's, you know, so many other bands that we were touring with that we would just like, Oh, these, these guys are great. You know, the band taken. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, it was, there was, there was just so, there were so many things that we were doing that was just like, this is where we should have been a year ago because right off the bat, as soon as the album came out, there was, a, there were a lot of folks cause the hard, hardcore scene, you know, like a, a, it, it was legitimately still and it's, you know, like, um, it was still on the rise as far as like people coming to shows and stuff. So folks would come and see us and they would see, oh, they've got piano sounds in their music and, you know, not really know how to respond to it as kindly as they would later on, you know? So, but I have, I don't, like I said, I don't blame them. There were folks that turned their backs to us on stage, like stand in front of the stage and then turn their backs with their arms crossed. And I was like, okay, tough guy. It's fine. You'll be a fan one day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and eventually they, you know, like I said, many of them came around to really appreciate the kind of music that we wanted to play. So. Yeah. There, um, it was an experimental time for a lot of people. You know, everybody's uh, early 20s. I think that's the time when your musical taste changes, when you change and you're figuring out who you are and where you want to go. So when I was like, when I was 18, 19, 20, I would tend to get mad at bands I liked when they were heavier and went more rock, right? And then when I was like 20, 21, I would kind of pretend to hate it 
And then six months later, after the hype died down a little bit, then I would like it. I don't know. It was just, it was like a weird thing. Like I had to decide when I was going to like it. Like no one could tell me. So it, I don't know. You, you think a lot of stupid stuff when you're young. Yeah. And it's like, um, I, I, I have to ask the question of a lot of these people, like, what are you expecting? I mean, there are bands that can literally reproduce the exact same album year after year, year after year, recre- you know, recreating the same things without expanding their, their boundaries. But, you know, like, it's weird because like, I think really ACDC is the only band that's allowed to do that. You know, exactly. They're the ones I always think of. And they're the, they're the only ones I really want that from. And uh, gee, yeah, chances are I'm going to be first in line when that album comes out, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Or I, like a uh, Mashuga, maybe like, oh, I, yeah. I don't, oh, yeah. I, I don't want them to put out like an emo record. I I want them to sound like Mashuga. Yeah. And you know, uh, they're, are hopefully other bands that you expect to change every time. You know, I can think, uh, you know, just a few examples. I've already named uh, Deftones, Tool, Radiohead, uh, Muse, Queens of the Stone Age. There's something new, an element that's new, even if they sound just like themselves, the band, you know? Yes. Um, so, like, yeah, it, it also, in my opinion, technology has a lot to do with that, creating that shape shift. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, at the end of the day, it really is all about, you know, the interface between the human being and the big red record button that's flashing. Yeah. But yeah, I was thinking about, uh, you mentioned that uh, MIDI interface, right? And yeah. I, And while you were talking about that, I was like, wow, maybe like the technology really dictates what's going on at the time too. Yeah, yeah. T- definitely so. I mean, uh, think about uh, Jimi Hendrix working with like engineers to build uh, wah wah pedals that are you know overdrive pedals and like all these new amp technologies that were arising in the late 1960s. Of course, that's going to influence a decade later. Of course, that's going to influence like what became punk rock. You know? Yeah. Uh, because it's just ev- everybody's always wanting to use, you know, like use technology to their advantage you know it's it's an important thing um you know just as an example even acdc a band that had nothing no other need to create the solid rock and roll that they create besides amplifiers guitars and drums and a microphone Mm -hmm. now i bet you if you were to go out on road with ACDC, you'd see so many technological advances that just make the touring process so much more efficient. They make the music performance process so much more efficient. So why not use that, you know? Right. Um, exactly. Uh, it, it, it's, really, it's really cool for me seeing this process uh, in action and like getting a chance to, uh, to experience setting up for a new show uh, like we're about to have on Friday, you know? Because now we are literally more gadgeted out than we ever have been. I'm looking at a wall right now. I'm looking at a wall, a rack of just a rack full of things. You know what I mean? And yeah. each, each one of them has a purpose. So. How old are you when the rescue is out and you're touring on that record? Uh, I was in my twenties, I think. So 2004 i can't i'm really bad so yeah i would have been probably about 25 or 26 at the time what's your life like at this time did you just want to do music full-time is that all you knew did you think about the future at all what was going on oh yeah i thought about the future a whole lot um at the time i think i was sort of uh going it it, those were my dark days Uh, i was going through uh a lot of like self-crisis with the relationship that I was in having ended and also, you know, uh, processing the fact that I had been witness to so many paranormal events, uh, happening in and around the period of like 1998 to, well, I mean, you know, I, I've, I had sightings starting in like 1995, 96, but they picked up and were so like regular that, um, we were constantly seeing UFOs on the road. And so I I think a lot of that process, that's what I was kind of obsessed with getting to the bottom of that. Did you see uh, ever any ghosts? Now, prior to this year, I didn't really believe any of this stuff, but 
my band member, uh, my band mate had told me about some experiences and I ex- kind of experienced something in a hotel room that oh, made weird. me question everything. Oh, like, yes, you did, Keith. It was a hotel yes. room. Yes, you did. Yes. Never doubt it. I have to. Okay. Now this is your podcast. You can yes. go down a detour if you want, but tell me your story. I want to hear your story. Okay, so we're in the hotel room in Jacksonville. We're on to, we're on a five day run of shows, right? Three of us in a room, and I don't like to sleep with all the lights off. I I always have LED lights or something on, but it was my first run with these guys, so I didn't want to be like, "Hey guys, can we put a light on?" So I'm like, "Let me suck it up, turn all the lights off." Uh, I have I'll watch Twitch on my phone. I'll be fine. And I woke up, and it was like someone was in the room. And I was really, had this really uncomfortable feeling. And I, I felt something bump the pullout bed I was sleeping on and the bed was shaking. And I'm like, oh, one of the guys must have gotten up to go to the bathroom, right? So I'm, I'm watching, watching, watching the door to see that someone come out and no one came out. And then I heard rustling and snoring in the bed and I'm like, they're both still in the fucking bed. And yeah. I, I, I was like terrified for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then somehow I fell back asleep. And the next morning I get up and I don't, the number 666 came up somehow. We were joking. I was like, 666, haha, good luck. And then uh, my bandmate was like, speaking of 666, how about that room last night? And we did not talk to each other. We did not tell each other this story. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, did you experience something too? And he woke up in the middle of the night and something was like talking to him, like in his head. And he yeah. had to like grab a a, p- a pencil and like write it down. And I didn't believe in any of this stuff really until that night. Oh, absolutely, Keith. Yeah. Um, an odd story is um, one of the two times in my life where I ever actually think I saw a ghost. Uh, one of them was, I think it was in Jacksonville. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> And it was at a hotel room. We had broken down. You know, I, I w- while you were telling the story, you mentioned Jacksonville. And I started thinking, wow, that's where that hotel was when we broke down. Was it so, in downtown? No, no. We're probably okay. talking about two different hotels. But okay. hotels in general have uh, a very, I mean, what's the common thread? People are always there and they're usually emotionally running pretty high for whatever reason when you're not at home at your own home your emotions are probably going to be running a little bit higher than they normally would so if something were traumatic to happen at a hotel or if someone were to live their last moments in a hotel it could make an imprint i've totally believed that it could make an imprint yeah and probably the room that you were staying in, something traumatic happened in its history. It's just, you know, sci- scientifically, there's no way to prove that you saw a ghost. But had you actually done the research about the hotel and had you actually gone back and looked to see a police report or whatever, you would have probably found out that someone in that room or one of the connecting rooms or a room nearby probably had a, you know, there was probably a death and there's probably an unsettled spirit still there, you know? I, I, yeah. was, I, I don't want to say spirit. I'll just look at it like this. I, 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 I refer to it as a uh, energy. I, I can yeah. buy more into a, a oh, looming absolutely. energy or an energy transference thing, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I like to look at it like maybe human beings are magnetic tape heads. And just like in a tape player, the filament that runs over the tape head that's in the actual tape, the tape itself is, is our environment. It's like where we're at at a time. And if something like makes an imprint or if something is uns- an unsettled bit of energy that has for whatever reason become disembodied, I totally think that that's legit. Yeah. That's really, and really interesting that it happened in Jacksonville. That's I, pff, wow. So, and, yeah. My, and my bandmate has other even crazier stories that really kind of make me believe and and he would have absolutely no reason to lie about this stuff so that's oh, why I, I believe yeah, it yeah. and you know other people i know have experienced things and they they would just have zero reason to like make up such a detailed fake story so that's why i kind of believe it but what did you see in jacksonville um you know what here okay what, what here's where we're going uh into the territory of i do this thing here in town 
at um, a really classy uh, place where I work. It's like a, a like a cocktail event mm-hmm. uh, on or around Halloween, Halloween, where people come and share their true stories. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm always like, oh, I would much rather hear more of your stories. But um, I'll tell you the one thing that I saw here. It's this second ghost that I ever mm-hmm. saw. I won't tell you the hotel story because I'm going to wait, Keith. And when you get a chance to meet John or James or anyone else from the band, you're going to have to ask them about that hotel when we broke down in North Florida. Okay. They'll know exactly what you're talking about because they had experiences there too. But uh, maybe about 10, 12 years ago, probably um, my sister-in-law was getting married in a church that's about 30 minutes away from where I live here in Winston-Salem. And the church itself was a newer looking church, but there was an older part of the church that they had built onto. And the wedding ceremony had taken place and I was hanging out with some of the groomsmen, you know, the bride and groom were already gone for the night and I was hanging out with some of the groomsmen and our instructions were to take the uh, wedding party's gifts out to my wife's mom's car to load them into her car. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking and there's an annex of the church that's a hallway that leads down and there's a door there that is clearly open that says nursery or day Sunday school or whatever you know yeah and if you've ever been at the mall or out in public walking through downtown or something like that and you pass by a person you instantly feel their energy and you just kind of like nod out of the side of your head right you know it's like how's it going that kind of thing and you just proceed to walk right so I, I look over I give a nod to a lady with gray hair, glasses, and a checkerboard pants suit on. I give a nod to her instinctively. Don't lock eyes with her. It's just what you do when you're passing by somebody. Took one step, Keith, and I felt ice cold. And the realization in my mind that I had seen the banister through that lady, like the door, the door frame through that lady, like she was transparent. I got ice cold instantly. And I realized, oh my God, I think that was an apparition. And here's the crazy thing is like, I'm walking and I just continue to walk with my hands are full of these presents or whatever. And I look back and one of my brother-in-law's brothers, who was also one of the groomsmen was carrying out the gifts behind me about maybe 10 feet behind me and just continued to walk by like nothing was there. It was weird. Yeah. So that's like the only thing I ever saw that I was like, I think that was an apparition. I don't know if it's a ghost. I don't know what I saw, but my mind did not play tricks on me. I just nodded at the lady and she was an old lady, like white, white lady with white hair and a checkerboard pantsuit. That's all I remember. It was just like this weird kind of houndstooth pattern. And I nodded, but as I'm nodding, I realized I can see the door frame behind her <laughs> and like took one step and everything, like the whole part of the hallway was cold. Yeah. Like, like temperature cold, not like my body got scared and I was instantly going into shock. This was a physical phenomenon of the environment around me getting cold. Wow. Yeah, it was That's, really cool. uh, yeah. like you. I would have I would have probably been, been able to see my breath. It was like that. You know what I mean? And, and the wedding took place in like June. So I, don't, I couldn't explain that. Was it an old building? This was the old part where I was at. The annex where the nursery school was the old part of the new church. It's always it's always old buildings or old parts of a building. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. Well, thank you for asking about that. I don't share that one often. I, I share I, I, yeah. You know what? As as I'm sitting here, I'm like, I can't believe uh I admitted this story and that I don't like to sleep with all the lights off. But you know what? I'm I'm happy to have this uh this conversation with you right now. Yeah, it's important to share these stories about the fringes of what we understand. Like um Yeah. Some that's you know that's a big theme on our latest album, um, not necessarily the paranormal, but just just fear in general, fear of the unknown. You know, there this there's this point where science and fiction kind of blur together, mm-hmm. and I really hope that Code Seven as a band, as our you know our our ethos evolves, that we just continue to carry that as a a common theme because like we've always been into you know we've always you know like when we were on the road we would see things in the sky and we would have conversations about them but i don't think that we ever like outwardly said hey this is a real phenomenon you know and it's not up to me to tell anyone it's a real phenomenon um and i kind of realized that like 
a good example was you, you said you were terrified, but you, you fell asleep about 15 minutes after that happened. Yeah. It's not like I was up all night, which is weird. Exactly. That's the, that's the human being defense mechanism that I think, I'll give, I'll give an example. There was one time, it was maybe about 11 at night. I was at a house with a couple of friends. Maybe about five or six of us were on their, uh, their deck outside of their house. So we have a clear view of the stars and we all see the same thing. And it was uh, a trio of stars in the classic uh, long asymmetrical pattern moving through the sky very like gracefully almost as if it, if they were rotating around each other but keeping the same um geometric pattern mm -hmm. and we all see it we're all like whoa whoa look wow look no now and think you know like other things were happening other things were happening with the the whatever it was that we were experiencing that would have normally made me feel like damn man our night just got you know like we, we're having this because I, I was used to seeing things like this, but I was like, we're now having this conversation. We weren't having this conversation at all. We're now having the UFO conversation. And so, so what happened is the UFO conversation inevitably, inevitably emerged. And I can, I would, I proceeded to tell them, oh, that's very similar to another sighting that I've had where these lights came out and did this different thing, but that, you know, whatever it might've been telling them about at the time. But almost to a T, like you said, like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes after it happened, we were back talking about Neil Young or whatever it was that we were talking about before, you know, like, <laughs> um, so you see how it's not up to me to perceive people's views for them. Like, I don't know what those people saw. Yeah. But when I see them every once in a while, I ask them because I'm still friends with some of them. As a matter of fact, just recently, I asked a friend about it. And that's what brought this to mind. And he was like, oh, you know, I haven't even thought about that until just now. What was that? That's so weird. Yeah, I think it's I think it's not up to me, though, because like I when I lived in a different city, this is during the 20 year period when I lived in a different city. It was kind of like I was a hermit and it was there was a lot of processing going on. Also, when I got into circuit bending was when I lived into the, in the city. But there was a lot of processing about my experiences that were happening and, and our experiences as humankind is concerned. I, I can't, you know, I, I, I can't be that guy though. I can't be the guy that brings it up at parties anymore because ultimately it might bring up something for somebody who just didn't really have a reason to rationalize that before. And I don't want to ask anyone to do that if they're not, you know, emotionally prepared to do so. I think some people would just much rather use that defense mechanism of blocking things out, but I enjoy exploring them. I just really love exploring them, you know? Yeah, I, di I, I didn't even think about this anymore until we started talking about it. This tends to be the only time that I bring it up. Plus, that's the only thing I've ever really experienced like that, so I don't have a, a lot to pull from. Well, you know, like, uh, I'll bet this has happened to you before. You, you, you don't have to keep uh, paranormal in a box. I think it's important to consider something that is on the fringes of what we understand as actual physical science doesn't have a boundary to it. So I'll bet you've been thinking about a song and then you, whatever random music uh, media device that you have you just ran that randomizes, that song will come on. Yeah. Okay. Now that happened, I'm sure that that happened to you well before algorithms occurred that can actually hear you say, Hey, I wish I listened to more Taylor Swift. And then all of a sudden Taylor Swift is more in your, you know, that's just, that's a thing that actually that's okay. That's not paranormal. But let's say you thought of a friend a couple of days ago and you haven't seen that friend in a long time. And then you just randomly run into that friend. Or like I said, you know, you, you have a, a FM radio, you would get into your car and the song that you had just been singing is on the radio. Those things in my mind are paranormal. You know what I mean? I think that if you've ever felt just like this compulsion to just do something at a moment's whim and it turns out to be a life changing event, no matter whether or not it's good or bad, I think that those all those things are are paranormal events. They're just not the mundane. They're they're not something that should be ignored. I love it. I love it. This was a very interesting detour. I'm glad this came up. Yeah, yeah. This is great stuff. Uh, what do you think? Uh, paranormal podcast 
starring Keith and Jeff. Yeah, uh, sure. an, an offshoot of the new scene. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the truth. There are some things that I consider to be really out there, um, and you know, having had a chance to meet some of those people, um, I will not deny or discredit their stories. I'll just say I think that probably someone has had like um, a, like some kind of emotional imbalance that created some kind of psychosis with them. Those people definitely should seek help. And if they are hearing voices or anything like that, they should definitely reach out to people that understand because that's not that's not something that's paranormal. I think that's something that's more of a mental and emotional thing, you know, like, so if you see, if, if you see a ghost, you should, you know, you should write it down, like, you know, get a journal, keep a journal, write those things down. But if you're ever seeing anything that's dark, you know, I would definitely seek help. You know what I mean? Like, that's not the kind of thing that you, you want to um, have hovering over your head, you know? There, there's a clear difference or there should be. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So definitely. So, yeah. I mean, I, you know, a lot, I think it's so funny in the 1950s, um, there were sanitarium sanatoriums, excuse me, where people with, uh, instabilities were just like housed and they were just not allowed to talk to anyone. You know what I mean? And it's just so sad that like people who were probably having normal, rational, ex uh, you know, life changing events happen to them. Um, we're saying, you know, I'm, I, I keep seeing my dead sister or, and they automatically, you know, you know, psychologists at the time automatically said, you're certifiably insane. So we're going to throw you away. You know what I mean? And it's a really sad thing that, you know, e you know, all the way back to, uh, s you know, someone, some woman in the, the village, the remote village having homeopathic remedy, natural remedies for cures and stuff. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all the crops die and they blame it on this, this woman who uh, here before only been there to help with common ailments and help, you know, carry on this age old tradition of natural medicine. You know what I mean? They were all treated as witches and they were like, Oh, it's the witch's fault. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to shift gears. I have more code seven questions if I may. Sure. All right. So the rescue is out. Good things are happening. I remember seeing the band around this time. I was out on the road with This Day Forward. Uh, I remember a lot of excitement from us about the record and from others. Uh, I assume you were getting on bigger and better shows as those years went on, yes? Yeah, yeah. Did you play with the Deftones at one point? I remember hearing that. We did, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was fun. Yeah, it was such an experience to have like uh, a broader audience. I really hope that we're, you know, we're able to pick up with that with uh, folks experiencing Go Let It In for the first time. Yeah. How was the reception at those bigger shows? Um, you've been to shows before, Keith. You know, nobody pays attention to the opening band. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, you know what? When I was younger, yeah, yeah. Now, now I do when I'm there, I'll watch all the bands, yeah. especially cause I don't drink now or anything. Yeah. I got nothing else to do, but yeah. yeah, when you're young, you don't care. Um, but yeah, and you know what? I've also at the same time discovered so many great bands, you know? Yeah. Through that, like Deftones is one of those bands. Deftones, I saw them for the first time opening for Corn and Orange 9mm. Wow. And I was like, yeah, that is cool. And it's the first time I'd ever heard Adrenaline. By the Deftones, it had just come out and they were on tour and I was like, this is cool. And, you know, you can name other bands that you discovered. You probably don't remember them all, but there are other bands that you discovered because they were the opening act. And uh, I really do hope that people found out about Code 7 through some of the um, some of the coattails that we were riding at the time, because they were they were all amazing bands. So many great bands. Um, I remember we did tours with like. Um, Hawthorne Heights and Acceptance and, um, you know, heavier bands that we were playing shows with. I just, I, I love all the, the people that we got a chance to meet. It was just so magical at that time. But, you know, um, the bigger shows, I, I remember very little about them because I think they were sort of surreal to me. Like, I get more nervous in a room full of about, you know, four or five people than I do in... Uh, front of a bunch of people, you know, like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 
So we're going. So what happens? Why did we break up initially? Um, the price of gas. I'm going to blame it on that. <laughs> it was the price of gasoline at the time. That's it. <laughs> we could we we couldn't uh, we couldn't gather enough muster to can you continue to tour so much. And I think that's kind of how we had come to define the band was a touring band. We were a touring band. We toured all the time. And I think we just couldn't, we couldn't sustain that. So the time off initially was probably just, you know, hey, everybody, I quit the band. Hey, we also individually quit the band. But the band, you know, the band never broke up. It was just one of those things where we stopped touring and then subsequently kind of sputtered out for, um, with songwriting and, you know, getting together to make music. Did the label say like, hey, where are you guys? What's going on? Oh, of course. I'm sure that we we probably pissed off so many people who had uh, prior investments and, in, you know, and seeing, seeing that process through of fulfilling the contract that we, you know, we were under. Um, and, you know, like, when we got back together and we said we're coming out with a new album, you know, Equal Vision was so supportive. They were like, well, if you're, you know, if you want to do it with us, you can. If you don't want to do it with us, that's fine. We immediately said, well, yes, we, of course, we want to do it with you guys. So um, I was just, you know, at the time, I'm sure we had so many other teams of people that were trying to make sure that uh, we continued to strive to be the next big thing. But the next big thing for me was really, um, I had a short attention span <laughs> and uh, um, I, I guess at that point, the next big thing was something that thankfully Matt, our drummer, he got a chance to experience, which was the uh, band's warp tour. And Matt went out on the road with a band called Adair and got to experience that, which was really cool for him, you know, but um, I, I didn't, th I, didn't, I don't think it was the thing for me. I would have probably, I definitely would not be here having this conversation with you, Keith, if that had happened, if we continued to, to be, um, heading down that path of, you know, that kind of rigorous, uh, dog eat dog. You have to have your, you know, you know, you have to have your image, uh, put directly into this perfect spotlight, you know, and it has to be the most appropriate time. You know, I, I'm excited because I think that as an opening band on some of the tours, people could discover us in their own time rather than, you know, oh, well, that's the band. Oh yeah. That's the band that opened up for such and such. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't, yeah, I really wouldn't say that having, um, you know, having those opportunities to play in front of, uh, larger crowds, we didn't do ourselves any favor by being, um, headphone music. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the best, best way I can describe it. Yeah. But now things are great because a live band can, be a headphone band in a live environment. And I just love that. That's so cool. Like that used to not be a thing. Like, you know, I think a lot of the places that we would play, we wouldn't have a sound guy. So we wouldn't understand the importance of sound reinforcement. And, you know, now that we're uh, doing this again with the uh, state of the art tech, we're like, you know, this is really, it's easy to get those um, bigger dynamics out of a live show that we, we just couldn't get then. You know what I mean? You show up the day of the show and if you have anything more than back then, it was really like that. You know, you would show up to a show and if you had anything more than a pa uh, an in-ear pack, the people would be like, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with it. You just use the monitors, you know? Right. And yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Because especially on uh, Dancing Echoes, Dead Sounds, there's a lot of nuance. It's not just riffs. So I, I, I imagine... Yeah, it was hard to get the sound that you guys wanted across a lot of the time, especially at, uh, well, I, I guess anywhere. Yeah, yeah. It was cool because we could see other bands doing it. Um, and we, uh, we, in a lot of ways, we were like, you know, drooling because they do it so well, you know. But um, for us, it was like uh, we, we, we could have benefited. One of the things that probably broke us up is that we didn't have a regular sound guy, <laughs> you know. You never thought about getting one? Um, we never really think about getting anybody like we right now, I'm going to go ahead and put this ad out on your uh, podcast. We need techs. We need people that know how to work this gear. I don't know. I'm looking at, like I said, I'm looking at that wall of equipment. I think I know what one of, one of those things does, <laughs> but, but if you don't know how it works, it's all shit, you know? 
Yeah. It's, so it's, if, you're, if you're interested in helping out Code 7, get in touch with them. Now is your opportunity. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty important that a band, if they write those those layers, that the audience is able to hear them, you know. What did you do after the band? There was a long period until the 2000, well, there, there was a pretty long period until the 2010 reunion. You said you were living in a different city. What were you up to? Um, like I said, mainly I was, you know, exploring uh, electronics, really getting into electronics and, um, you know, I think a lot of that uh, process that I mentioned earlier of like, you know, like trying to rationalize and still be a, a normal, uh, fully functioning human being because of all the chaos that I'd been through was, um, there was a lot of self-care. Um, I got married in that time period to the most beautiful woman and her name is Jamie. And it was, I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick to the side there. This was in 2010. So I, I proposed to my wife, we set our, our date, our wedding date, and it was October 2nd. And um, maybe a month or so after we set our date, uh, we get offered this proposal to go on the road with Circus Survive and Animals as Leaders and Dredge. Yes. And so I go to my wife and I tell her, hey, this tour starts like literally when we are going to be in Jamaica on our honeymoon. And she was like, go for it you know, just start the tour a little, a couple of days late. So we joined up to think three days into the tour. She, my wife always looks at it as her, that was, I think, I think she always looks at it like that was her honeymoon is going out on the road. Cause you know, the second that we got back from Jamaica, I literally had like within a 24 hour period had to jump into a van and start our tour and say goodbye to her for like three weeks or something like that. And then she joined us three weeks later, she joined us on the tour and had an amazing time and got to meet all the people like, you know, the people that we had known, the people that we were just meeting on the tour. And, you know, I think she kind of thinks of that as, as our honeymoon, but it was kind of, you know, that was kind of our honeymoon as well as Jamaica, which Jamaica was the most beautiful place on the earth. You know, like I, that was, I, I, I would have, you know, there, I did nothing bad against Circus Survive animals as leaders or dredge but i would have stayed in jamaica nothing not knocking any code seven fans but you could have done without another code seven album you could I, if i were still in jamaica i think everything would be great <laughs> but they made me come back and i was there only for a week at a resort <laughs> they made me come back uh, i i hate when you ha i hate when you're having a great time in jamaica and you have to come home and tour with circus survive yeah. and animals as leaders awful awful and awful. dredge Ugh. That must have been some tour. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Um so so like we were slated to play on, throughout the tour after Animals as Leaders. <laughs> after? <laughs> How are you supposed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would give me such anxiety every night. Oh god, they were so great. They were so great. They yeah. are they are so great. Tosin is just so magical. And I'm so yeah. proud. I'm so proud like, you know, um, a lot of people will say, hey, I knew him when, but Tosin is always the same person. So if you knew him when, you know him now, you know, and it's just so great because he, he's, I don't know, he's so productive. I love how he does a little bit of everything nowadays. It's so cool. And, you know, you know, th another thing is like, you know, Anthony Green was just such a role model to have and to appreciate as a friend because like, you know, we'd known him during the, you know, we met him during the Soasin era, uh, Soasin era, and then when he joined with the guys in this day four, we were like, that's so magical. And then Nick from Taken, it was just like, that's so magical that that happened. You know, I've never known the story about how it happened, but I am not at all surprised because creative folks are like magnets and they tend to attract, the polarities tend to attract toward what we started talking about, which was the greater good of the music. And yeah, having a chance to tour with them after Circus Survive had already become very well established and you know total great efficient tour packaging and everything we learned a lot about tech on that tour and that was all the way back in 2010 so yeah yeah i forgot about a lot of that that you just mentioned and the story of circa coming together and just the different people from different bands and different times and how that all came together is 
pretty incredible because I know all of them and we all grew up in the same hometown. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, this is the only podcast to have every member of Circus Survive on. So you can go back yourself and listen to the story from their own mouths. So Yay, there you go. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're amazing. So amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that's I, awesome. Yeah. I think, you know what? I think I gave Steve uh, one of my circuit bent uh, Cassie, uh, my circuit bent Texas instrument uh, speaking spells. So if anybody's seen Steve lately and he still has that, I want to know if it still works because I had modded it so that there was a um, an old school NES controller at the bottom. So oh. you, you you literally just glitch out this speaking spell with a, an NES controller. I'm going to ask him for you. I talk to him like almost every week. Yeah, yeah. Just tell him I said, hey. Yes. Tell, him, t- tell him I hope he's still uh, got fresh batteries for that thing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so cool. Um, that's so cool that you've had them all on. They're so sweet. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're good friends, good friends. Um, so let's recap. Now, the new record, Go Let It In, arguably the best Code 7 record to date. I'm going to say it is. It's out there right now. And we want people to listen to this and to purchase it and to listen to it. Right, Jeff? That's correct. Thank you so much. That's such a kind plug there. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, wherever you listen to your music, please make sure that you include uh, Code 7 in uh, a few songs from our new album, because that's just so magical to me that that anyone would want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still very humble about it. You have the show this Friday, but is is there any other shows coming up uh, in the near future or distant future that we can talk about now? Yeah, in the new part of the year, we're going to be playing it in the Northeast. That's all I'll tell you. Ooh, I yes. like that. Yes. I'm in the Northeast. I want to come see you. Yes, yes. I can't wait to to see you again after all these years. It'd be so great. Yeah, I think the last time I saw you was... I don't, I think it was like 2003. I have a memory of seeing Code 7 somewhere. I don't know where, I don't know when, but it's been that long. I wasn't talking about UFOs, was I? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're one of the rare folks that I met during that time period then. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I, like you, I only remember like very small pieces of it. Yeah, it was. I just know I had so much fun. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Jeff... I appreciate everything you do and everything you're doing. And I've been listening to you a long time. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Keith. It's so great, man. Um, Best of luck to everything that you're doing and all the amazing guests that you have on. I'm truly, truly humbled that you had me. So, um, yeah, really thank you so much. And thank you to everybody listening. And there you have it. Jeff Jenkins. Really, really, really awesome conversation. Happy to talk to Jeff. Haven't spoken. Well, you know what? I don't even know if I spoke to him back in the day. I remember seeing Code 7. I remember being out with This Day Forward, who was friends with Code 7. But I don't even remember if I officially met Jeff or if we talked or anything. I just remember seeing them and liking them. But it was great to have Jeff on the show. That conversation was great getting the full history on Code 7, hearing about the rescue, which has been a favorite of mine for a long time. And when the conversation diverted into the UFO and ghost story stuff, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting to share that story. I don't remember if I told that story after it happened over the summer when I was out with uh, the Darling Fire and, and Spotlights. I don't remember. But I was happy to share it because, look, I didn't believe in ghost stuff until I was at a friend's bar in Williamsburg, right? A friend of a friend. I'm there. He was renovating his bar slash restaurant slash coffee shop. There's an old section of the bar. And he told these incredible ghost stories of some experiences he had there and some things he saw while renovating an old piece of the building. And I was like, why would this guy be making up all of this stuff right now? Why would he be making up these very detailed stories of things he experienced while he was here taking care of business. Why? Why? 
And then the thing happened in the hotel room in Jacksonville. That happened. And that I actually experienced. I didn't talk to my bandmate about that. We didn't know what happened until the next morning. And I wasn't even going to say anything until he brought it up. So, I mean, hey, it was just really interesting stuff. And Jeff was really interesting. Super interesting guy. And I'm happy that Code 7 is back with, I would say, their strongest release yet. Go let it in. Make sure you check out the record. Make sure you support Code 7. And I look forward to seeing them when they're here in the Northeast. So thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on the show. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? I'm doing great. I have cleared my calendar this weekend because I really need some time off. I've been in the studio a lot working on some new music. I've been really busy with podcast stuff. We're starting to schedule 2024 guests. And um, I just needed time off. So the only thing I'm working on this weekend is this podcast, basically. It's a beautiful 53 degrees here in Brooklyn, New York. I can't believe it. It's so nice out. I'm going to find some time to go outside and take a walk around a little bit later. But right now, I sit here with you and record the show. I played Warzone all morning. I'm happy to announce that the new Warzone and the new map is excellent. I had quit the game during Modern Warfare 2 and Al Mazra because I hated it. I hated the mechanics. It felt clunky. The map was boring. I didn't like the rebirth maps. Okay, that newest rebirth map that they introduced, that one was pretty good. The one with all the rooftops, I don't remember the name of it, but the new Battle Royale map is excellent. I spent a lot of time playing it today, and I recommend it to all of you. There's a lot of great show announcements too, so get this. Dillinger Escape Plan have announced a reunion show with Dimitri Minakakis. Now that is crazy. I was not expecting that. I was not expecting a Dillinger reunion anytime soon, and I was certainly not expecting it with Dimitri, but I'm excited about this. Calculating Infinity is my favorite record by the band, and they'll be performing it in full. That's crazy. I I have tickets to the Saturday gig, which is one of the most insane lineups I've ever seen. Dead Guy, The Callous Dow Boys, and Dillinger Escape Plan. Wow. Wow. And you know what? I went back and read, there was an article on Metal Injection that Ben Weinman did a while ago, where he was shutting down rumors uh, of any Dillinger Escape Plan reunions. Apparently, Greg Puchado had mentioned somewhere that he got big offers for Dillinger reunions, and then Ben responded in this article and shut it down. But when I go back and read the article again, it's very telling. Get this. Ready? Ben says in the article, the truth is that any discussions of a reunion with Greg have been shut down before money was discussed. Huh? With Greg? Hmm? There have been no concrete money offers for a reunion with Greg, meaning that the conversations have never gotten to money as they've always been shut down immediately. Huh? With Greg? Hmm? Ben goes on to say, my response to anyone asking was that the Dillinger escape plan would not be performing with Greg and that we ended that chapter of the band in the appropriate way as everyone saw. Wow. Looks like the answer was in front of our eyes the whole time. They would not be performing with Greg. Well, I'm happy to have this iteration of the band back and I'm super excited for this gig. Also, a huge tour was announced. Koyo, One Step Closer, and Anxious. And Life's Question will be on select dates of that tour. And Stateside will be on select dates of that tour. That's the, that's the new morality zine band. I remember them. I'm really excited for this one too. I've never seen Anxious. I've been waiting to see Anxious. I've been anxious to see Anxious. Hmm? Hmm? I'm sorry. Also, One Step Closer, I don't think I've seen since This Is Hardcore 2017, 2018. Gotta see them. And Koyo, I have not seen since Furnace Fest in, I think, 2021, 2022. I can't remember. But all three of these bands on one tour, wow. Wow. 
really excited for that as well. So I failed to mention it last weekend, but I did catch Rid of Me live. I was in the studio, I was doing vocals for a song all day, and then I ran over to St. Vitus. There was a 15th anniversary showcase for Brutal Panda Records, right? And Rid of Me played that. So I got there just as Rid of Me was starting, and I left right when they were done because I was exhausted. I had been in the studio screaming my head off all day, and I was tired, but I was really happy to see Rid of Me for the first time, got to say hi to Iteria, who I haven't seen in the longest time, got to say hi to Mike, who I haven't seen in a long time, and uh, Jordan from Sunburster was there too. Haven't seen him in a long time, so it was great to catch up with some Philly people and to see a great band. So that's pretty much everything that's going on, so let's check in with the new scene community hour. We were stuck at 157 Apple Podcast reviews for a while, but some new ones have come in, and I'm going to read them now. We have a new review from Solar Powered Sun Destroyer, and the review says, five stars, show rips, Keith is God. I love that. I love that. Is that Jimmy? Is that you, Jimmy? We remember Solar Powered Sun Destroyer. They're a great band. I've played with them before. Thank you so much for the review. Thank you so much for the support. We've got another review from Straight Edge Vegan, and they said, Five stars. Just came across the Popeye interview. As a longtime Farside and your favorite train wreck fan, I was super psyched to hear some updates. Keith did a great job, and Popeye seems like a straight up likable dude. Amazing interview. Keep up the great work. And thank you. Straight Edge Vegan for that review. Yes, Popeye is definitely a straight up likable dude. That's one of my favorite discussions I've had all year, easily. And thank you for the reviews. We're up to 162 now. Keep them coming. We've got to get to 200. We have to. So that's it for this week. That is it for this week, but we are back next week on Christmas Day because here at the new scene, we do not take days off. We do not take weeks off. I am here every single week, no matter what, as long as I am conscious. And I will be doing my annual Top 10 Records of the Year review with Casey. I'll show my top 10. He'll show his top 10. And we will have an exclusive interview with one of the artists on the list. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. You'll have to wait until next week to see. So we are going to end the show with my favorite Code 7 song. It's called The Rescue, and it's from their album, The Rescue. I'll add it to the New Scene 2023 Spotify playlist. Go check out that playlist. I've got all my recommendations on there. I've got all of our guests on there. It's a great one-stop shop to hear all the music associated with the show. I'll see you next week.